Inner Voice. A heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice podcast. It is so great to be with you today. I'm Dr. Fujian Zain, a psychotherapist and author and the originator of the awareness integration theory. Our heart heartfelt chat is about what matters most in our lives, our minds, our thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life with ourselves, with our family, and with our community. There are many of you who are asking about the latest books and articles that are coming up for um, awareness integration uh, theory, please go to my website, fujanzain.com, and uh, get all the um, latest books that have been there and uh, articles. We're publishing a lot of articles and um, all of the courses that are for the therapist to um, um, have them become certified in the awareness integration model. So go to fujanzain.com or awarenessintegration.com and uh, Please, please get your information. Today, I'm honored and I'm so excited to uh, to speak with uh, Dr. Janet Afari. She holds a Millie Camp Chair in Global Religion and Modernity at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where she is the Professor of Religious Studies. She is the Historian of Modern Iran with a PhD in History and Near, Near East Studies from the University of Michigan, where her dissertation received a Distinguished Rackham uh, Dissertation Award. Previously, she taught at the Department of History and the Program in Women's Studies at Purdue University, where she was appointed a university faculty scholar. Her books include Sexual Politics in Modern Iran, the Iranian Constitutional Revolution, Grassroot Democracy, Social Democracy, and the Origins of Feminism, um, FOCO and Iranian Revolution, Gender and Seductions of Islamists, uh, Charando Para and the Revolutionary Satire in Iran, and her latest book based on the large study that she has done, um, Iranian Romance in the Digital Age from Arranged Marriages to White Marriages, Sex, Family, and Culture in Middle East. Her articles have appeared in The Nation, The Guardian, Huffington Post, and numerous other scholarly journals and edited collection. You can find out more about her and to go to Janet Afari. J A N E T A F A R Y dot com to get to know a little bit more about her. Um, I asked her to join me in this podcast to give a historian and a scholar's view of uh, what the women led um, revolution that is happening in Iran and uh, were more than a um, hundred, hundred some days into the revolution and is still going on. And uh, to give us, um, not only Iranians, but the non-Iranians, a perspective of why now, why in Iran, and what is happening. I truly always learn from her. She's an amazing scholar. And um, I hope that you enjoy this conversation as much as I've done. Please subscribe to this podcast, my YouTube channel, and connect with me through all my social media. Go to my website, fujanzain.com. Um, and uh, get all the information that you need. I really love to hear from you. And without further ado, here's Dr. Janet Afari. It is so nice to have you with us, Dr. Janet Alfari. Um, you know what a big fan I am of you. I've always learned from you. And on this topic of uh, the Iranian revolution, women-led revolution, I kept thinking about um, my friends who, um, my colleagues, my friends, um, our listeners, a lot of them are not Iranians and might not necessarily know all the details that we might know uh, from what's going on um, in this important historical event. And it's ongoing. I think it's like 100, 101 or two days of constant um, uprising. And I thought, who better than you uh, for, for this matter to be opened, not only from a historical perspective, 
but also from a woman's perspective and from an, a scholar perspective. So thank you for taking the time and being with us. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for your invitation. It's always been a pleasure to participate in your programs. Thank you. So a um, couple of thought comes for me, which is this is the first historical women-led um, revolution. And it, it's happening from the Middle East and it's happening from Iran. So based on your um, historical um, um, information, why now and why in Iran? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, to begin with, uh, gender issues are the issues of our time. If we look at the United States, we see that almost every American election has revolved around some major gender and sexuality issues, whether it's been birth control or abortion rights, for example, for the last 40 years, or gay rights movements, uh, which is another form of um, gender issues, you know, gender and sexuality issues. In other words, we are, as a result of urbanization and modernization, dramatic changes in uh, health and birth control. Societies around the world have changed. And one of the things that we see is that the old social hierarchies, uh, which um, were accepted social hierarchies and were recognized ones, um, and that involved particularly the institution of marriage and the way uh, when a woman should get married. It wasn't even a question of when uh, or why it was that she did get married. She did have children. And then she put all her energy and effort in the service of her husband and built him up, you know, and hopefully in the process, she also got something out of the relationship, got a, got a family. So all of these have... <clears throat> are breaking down. And the reason they're breaking down is because of the massive technological revolution that we're seeing around us. So people live longer, um, they have fewer children, there are less jobs available, and the jobs are not the kinds of jobs where you have to be very strong and physically, you know, you could, most of the jobs today, many of the jobs today are, can be done from a computer. Um, from sitting. So that old physical barrier um, in, in gender relationships that was a prerequisite of the old hierarchy, that has also break, broken down. And so what we see is that, <clears throat> you know, in the same way that the institution of slavery, for example, came um, became redundant in a world in which you no longer to produce had to actually tie people to the land to be able to produce for you. Um, and you had modern capitalism, which operated in an entirely different way with the workers. I mean, still exploited, but there wasn't a necessity to exploit them by tying them to the land, for example, or, tie, or chaining them. That kind of a thing is, is happening in our world. And so that we need to keep that in mind. And so, but each society is, uh, reacting a little differently, of course, to it. Now, in Iran, <clears throat> first of all, let me say that Iran was far more conservative in gender relationships when compared, for example, to Ottoman Turkey or uh, the Rus Muslims of the Russian Empire. When we look at the, um, for example, the late 19th century, early 20th century, um, in Turkey, girls were going to school. They had schools of midwifery. They have a lot of women's publications. Uh, in the North Caucasus, which is the area that's today Azerbaijan, uh, Republic of Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia, and used to be part of the Russian colonialism, women were going to schools. Most middle-class women were going to Russian schools, for example. And there was an effort in the Muslim community also to change uh, and bring women and give them more education. That was not the case in Iran. And Iran has had a system where it's been really um, ruled by both a king historically, but also by the Shiite clerics. The Shiite clerics in Iran had enormous power, uh, very different from the Sunni clerics, for example, <clears throat> and certainly from clerics in Russia, 
uh, who were under Russian colonialism. So in Iran, they had a lot of money. They collected money. They taxed people, a uh, form of religious tax they collected. And they also had their own laws, set, set their own laws. Uh, and the laws that the clerics set were the more important laws that compared to the laws that the king set, basically, you know. So um, because of that, um, uh, you know, so so that's one part of it, why it was so difficult. The other part is that Shiism is like Judaism, uh, what we call a religion revolving around purity and impurity. So just as in the Jewish tradition, <clears throat> you know, you have to perform certain rituals and certain kind of washing your body. It's called mikveh, mikveh avoiding certain foods um, to be able to be kind of ritually pure and therefore your supplications to God be accepted. I mean, that's the basis of the religion. Islam is very similar to that um, in the sense that rules and regulations about ritual purity are very important. In these religions where you have a lot of regulations, it's sort of assumed that impurities come from outside. Uh, and so women and women's bodies uh, become really like a door that you have to keep it closed so that these impurities can come in. So there's particular attention to women's conduct in these societies, who they go with, who certainly who they have sex with, because of course, sex is the, the biggest form of, in this view, in this worldview, penetration of impurities into a society, right? And so that means that there are a lot of rules and regulations uh, on a woman's conduct. So that's sort of the basis of why when we look at the early 20th century, we see that um, there's a big difference here, um, not just with European women, but also with some other Sunni Muslim societies. So the first effort um, <clears throat> to break this is actually a little bit in the middle of the 19th century, the rise of the Babi movement. And the Babi movement tries to reform Islam, wants to reform Shiism. And of course, the, the most important leader of it is a woman. Um, she wants to unveil and she wants to bring women into the social order uh, and break down the severe uh, boundary between the sexes. Uh, that movement is persecuted by the, the clerics primarily, um, but also by the king. So then the next stage of that is the Constitutional Revolution of 1906. And the Constitutional Revolution has a lot of similarities to this movement that we have right now. It's very secular. It wants to reduce the powers of the clerics. It wants to reduce the powers of the king. It's open towards the West, towards modernity. And it really wants to bring women, uh, give, give women a lot of more authority. In that period, that meant education, and bringing women to the public sphere. <clears throat> and so we see a lot of activities and we have male intellectuals who are really strong supporters of women's rights in this period. Um, that movement is broken down by Western intervention because it's a democratic movement. And of course the colonial powers don't like to see a democratic Iranian society. So then the next stage is <clears throat> the 1920s and 30s when Iran is ruled by the Pahlavi regime. And the Pahlavi regime is uh, modern. It's, it wants to bring modernity to Iran, but it doesn't want to bring democracy to Iran. So at this point, the intellectuals of Iran decide that, okay, at least they'll get half of what, it, what they want from this regime. They'll have a more modern Iranian society and maybe they can have democracy at some later point, but right now this is all they can have. And so the introduction of modernity means sciences are embraced and the bringing of sciences into Iranian society breaks down a lot of those old social hierarchies. So you actually have scientists talking about how, you know, immersion in a pool of stagnant water for ritual purity is actually getting you sick rather than giving you ritual purity or you have vaccination. Vaccination is a really big issue. Um, the clerics think of it as impurities entering your body, but the scientists say, no, this is the way you know you deal with, um, so, <laughs> it reminds me a little bit about the debates we're having about COVID right now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Some cycles of society, yeah. 
Um, they say, no, actually, that's the way uh, <clears throat> that's the way you get rid of, of germs and diseases, you know, by vaccination. And so the introduction of sciences really does help women quite a bit because it breaks down a lot of the, that old way of thinking. Uh, so women could come to schools and high school and then they go to university and they enter the workforce. By the 1940s, um, Iran has a very large communist party. Um, and so now you have the beginning of leftist ideas, you know, workers' rights, but that includes women workers, it includes childcare, opening of child cares, for example, maternity leave. Uh, <clears throat> and communism in general was, of course, more egalitarian. Iranians were not the kind of communists that you have in the Soviet Union. They're more, I would say in this period, more like social democrats. So, you know, benefits that could state could provide that would improve the standard of living of poor people and working class people, particularly working class women, for example. And so women make a lot of progress in that period too. Uh, women are part of the nationalist movement of the 1950s when this issue of nationalizing Iran's oil becomes a really huge issue. And the prime minister who's pushing it, Mohammad Mossadegh, is a strong supporter of women's rights and also a strong supporter of breaking down these hierarchies. So um, not only does he support um, you know, uh, election of women, for example, he's actually totally for giving the right to vote for women. Uh, he has to back off because of the clerics opposition at a certain point, but he also wants to end the segregation of that in, impacts the Baha'is, for example, in Iranian society, a religious minority. Um, <clears throat> so that's also another important step which happens. Uh, in the 50s through 70s, we go back to another form of the Pahlavi regime, modernization, but without democracy. And again, one more time, there's a lot of improvement that happens um, in this period uh, in terms of a, creating a modern Iran society. Oil is valuable and it's very much in demand. Iran is able to sell its oil at reasonably decent prices now in the 50s through 60s and 70s, and the money is poured and Iran is industrialized. So there's a massive industrialization that goes on. And this means more women enter the workforce, work, work in factories. And so that breaks down also the social hierarchies of um, marriages and no long, is no longer the, you know, the old arranged marriage where your parents were arranging it for you. Because when a, even a working class woman, she moves to the city, she meets another worker at her workforce and her parents may not even be around when she decides to marry this guy. Same thing is happening in the middle-class communities gradually. We were breaking with the old uh, highly arranged marriages. I mean, the parent, they, they still want their parents to approve the support, uh, but it's not quite as, as extensive as it was, for example, in the 20s and 30s, right? So that becomes a big thing also. Wanting their blessing uh, is different than um, having them to choose for them. But there was also the uh, the breakdown of the hijab and having the the choice of for the first time to have, for women to have the choice of their own attire. Correct. So the uh, the first Pahlavi regime had lifted sort of, or rather, I should say, it had ordered uh, hijabs to be removed. And the reason that Reza Shah did that in 1936 is because he, he realized that the Western world was looking at the Middle East, at Iran, and say, oh, these are backward people, you know, look at the way the women dress and look at the way. And he decided that the most important thing in his view that he could do was to change uh, the world's perception. And the easiest way to do it was to take off the turban, remove it with a regular European hat and suit, and for women to take the veil off. And uh, and, so, and in fact, that did, you know, that did create, change the image of Iranians throughout society. Now, of course, it created a lot of backlash also, particularly among the clerics. Um, but by the 50s and 70s, the hijab had become more voluntary, right? So in the more traditional sectors of society, the clerics, for example, and family, the merchants of the bazaar, the women still wore a kind of a loose hijab, um, no longer covering their face or any 
very strict one. But in the um, secular, more secular middle classes, no, it had been completely discarded, um, actually. And that, so that was a really big change that, you know, women were miniskirts um, in the street and uh, the latest fashion, um, you know, you, they would try to copy the latest fashion. But this actually became, uh, uh, and but the, the changes were not just cosmetics. There were also big changes that happened in terms of law. So for example, there were substantial numbers of Iranian women now in Congress, in Iranian Congress, in Iranian parliament, women judges, um, women lawyers, uh, and women who were uh, running uh, various NGOs, for example, and um, government organizations that supported women's issues to start to raise the question of greater rights for women in marriage and divorce. So um, divorce became um, a little bit easier for women. Child custody became possible, for example. I mean, these were really, really huge changes in Iran. Um, and but but here then is what really happened, which is that, uh, and I've written about this in my work, which is that in a way you had a social contract at the beginning of twentieth century, where <clears throat> more conservative um, people, sectors of society were promised that if you let women become educated and go into the workforce, maybe even marry a little bit later than you know thirteen and fifteen into their um, late teens or 20s, um, that all of this meant that the old social contract would still remain in place. In other words, women would remain dutiful daughters, dutiful wives, and 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 uh, obedient, um, you know, to their husband, to their father, for example, even to their brother. And so now this is breaking down um, in a really dramatic way because, of course, modern society gave women certain authorities. Um, and, you know, if you got married to some of your parents, help, said you should marry this guy and you married him and he was abusive, you could get out. You now could actually get out of that marriage and you could go to get a job and you could live in your own apartment. And But these were really jarring issues, um, huge issues. And I would say a substantial sector of Iranian society uh, was angry about it. Um, not Muslim and non-Muslim, Jews, Christians, Baha'is, and all of these sectors. And this is a period in which I lived. And one thing I kept hearing was that, you know, women are becoming very uppity and, uh, you know, uh, demanding too much. And they're no longer those nice, obedient girls and women that they used to be. Um, so that becomes uh, something that then, when you have the revolution of 1979, it's something that the leftists and the Islamists can agree on. They basically can agree on that what they consider these frivolities of the West, basically the sexual revolution of the West, that this is unacceptable. You know, that we accept. So Iranian society is never, you know, like the Taliban regime where the, the government tries to like ban education. That never happens in Iran. The question is over sexual freedoms of women. And the when you look at the Islamic Republic and the sort of laws that it imposes, it doesn't prevent women from going to school or even getting a job or, or being in public. It tries to um, limit their exposure in public spaces and it tries to take away the rights in marriage from them. So giving back to fathers, for example, the right to marry their daughters at a young age or giving many, many rights to husbands um, in marriage, making it really difficult for women to leave marriages. And in a way, you could say that the Islamic revolution um, in some ways also assumes the role of the patriarch. So, you know, before if a woman wore her hijab, it didn't wear her hijab, but whether she wanted to get married young or older, it was a father who protested or it was a husband who protested. But now you have the Islamic Republic play the role of the patriarch as a government. And it really doesn't matter what the father says. I mean, the father may have no problem at all with his daughter wearing the not wearing the hijab on the street. It's the state that says, no, you have to wear the hijab. So, you know, something like this had been actually unprecedented. It's the state that says, 
uh, you know, you can't have custody of your children, basically, right? Um, it's the state that says you can use birth control or not use birth control. Um, so that's a very, very different stage. But what it does is that it breaks down then the authority of the fathers. The fathers and the husbands, in a sense, become um, emasculated, you know, uh, because if their daughter is taken by the police for, in, you know, going to a party, which becomes very popular in this period, um, certainly not observing her hijab and quietly dating the guy, a father goes there and pleads for his daughter. He can't get her out, you know, unless he pays a huge fine and then her daughter is still lashed. So what authority does that father have anymore in the eyes of his daughter or his son? None, really. So... The one of the results, unanticipated perhaps results of the Islamization is that the Islamic Republic breaks down all furthermore that hierarchy mm -hmm. okay. in which fathers ruled really. And um, respect so because some, some part of the before the family hierarchy was also held by respect and not just fear. And it's very good, whole, yes. Whole concept yes. broke now, it's just the fear of outside and then. Somehow, even maybe the whole family will unite against the outside world versus, you know, be before it was a hierarchy of respect. Right. The other way in which the old family hierarchy broke down is that for most people, for most families, the way his son got a job was through his father or his family, extended family. You know, your father was a cobbler, was a shoemaker, uh, he was a tailor, um, some kind of a job, you know, money lender. And the son went into that profession, right? And so then he amassed some money and then he, with the blessing of his father, because he actually was working for his father or his uncle, he would then get married. A state starts uh, hiring people in huge numbers, you know. Uh, and many of these people are hired, uh, well, they're hired uh, as pastoran, for example, as revolutionary guards, for example, to maintain this regime. A state apparatus, the state employment becomes gigantic during this period. And so now, remember the war also, of course, happens between 1980 and 1988. Many, many people go into the war. Millions of people basically are recruited into the war. But the war also means you get, well, a lot of people die, but you, you get veteran veterans benefits, right? And then through that, you also go through get employment in other state institutions. So for both men and women, you now have a variety of employments that are available um, that no longer rely on the old you know, father or your uncle giving you a job. And that gives this young generation a lot of power. Mm -hmm. um, the state also deliberately breaks down some of the old rituals. You know, the, in, and you know, remember this um, Islamism in Iran is very influenced by communism and Maoism. I mean, that's really where they're looking at. Although they call it Islam and they bring back a lot of rituals, a lot of the ideas that they introduce are things that they learn from particularly from Maoism. So the idea of group weddings, for example, becomes very common. Um, the state starts to give you a little money for getting married. So. Now you have, let's say, you're this traditional girl or boy. You meet someone um, as in in the state as part of this revolutionary guard, for example, that you are. Uh, you fall in love, you know, which was not possible in the very old traditional society. When you want to get married, you don't really need your father's permission because you have the blessing of the state authorities and the state clerics who are happy to give it to you. They help you, they give you some money for your marriage. They even maybe help you with your uh, marriage ceremony. Um, uh, and then you have jobs afterwards. So you could see how the old family hierarchy, which you had said very well, was based not just on fear, but also on need and on respect. Mm -hmm. So the need breaks down and the respect also breaks down, you know? And with those two, the fear then it becomes a lot less, right? So those are some really dramatic changes. The state introduces a family planning program and the population really goes up. 
And the idea, they just want to bring down the population. They, again, they don't think about what is this actually going to do to our society. But in any society where women have become ed more educated and have had access to birth control, um, the birth rate goes down, dramatically goes down. You know, Because the first thing women want to do is to have less children and spend more time on the children they have. And so the children they have live longer because the woman now knows, knows a little bit more about health, for example, vaccination, taking your daughter or son to the doctor. So if she has a couple kids, that's enough, you know. Well, sometimes. There's so many more available roles for women that being a mother is only one role. Correct. And sometimes it's like, you know, taking care of that role, but also now hoping that they could do what, what they can do best, but also open their space and time for other roles to experience. And if you're having, you know, multiple children, that takes away those years for you to have the accessibility to become a business person or an artist. Right, you know? exactly. But the husband also, interestingly enough, agrees now for several reasons. Uh, first, you have a pension system that the government sets up. I mean, the main reason people want to have multiple children is a couple of them maybe will have a job, a good job, and then they can take care of their parents. But if you have less children and then there is a pension system, you start to worry less about having a lot of children. So the men agree, the men come on board basically on this project of having less children. Um, and so that becomes a really big change too. So now you have families are smaller and uh, <clears throat> birth control makes it also possible to have better sex, you know, because it gives, it makes it possible for you to have sex in different periods in the month, for example, not have to limit it to just the period when you can not get pregnant, for example. It, it introduces communication. In fact, one of the pro early programs of the Islamic Republic is that they understood, again, looking at the example of China and, and Russia and, and Latin America, that if you want to introduce birth control, you have to have the husband and wife talk to each other. You have to have better sex so that they could actually plan various forms of birth control. And so that also changes. So with all that, you see the nature of marriage changes, the nature of relationship changes. Women now start coming, becoming involved in leadership positions. Um, and so uh, these are huge changes and not which I wouldn't say that the Islamic Republic wanted them to happen, but many of them are the unintended consequences. So, you know, um, by about 10 years ago, we began to see women quite active in the leadership role of social movements of Iran. So um, we see them- think, uh, Dr. Afari, we also saw, saw uh, most women going into higher education in Iran, uh, getting their bachelor's degree, master's degree, uh, doctorate degree. And they also opened up a lot of NGOs, people who uh, their age was a little bit older, they had raised their children and they wanted to come back and support the community. They really took on, um, you know, NGOs and they took on businesses. Correct. They took on, you know, owning a land on, and having a lot of different type of women-led businesses, exactly the same way as maybe the Western. Right. Market. And even the ones who work part-time, they could cobble together a decent living. You know, uh, she would maybe teach uh, yoga in the morning, have a, a tour agency, for example. And many people started having restaurants in their homes, for example. So there were many multiple ways in which women learned to earn a living. And of course that gave them more authority and power in the family. And so with all that, we begin to see uh, uh, a larger number of women in leaderships of uh, also political organizations, these campaigns that are formed, campaigns for the rights of political prisoners, for example, campaigns against execution in the country, for example. Uh, and they become lawyers, particularly as you know, as and you said, or heads of NGOs, and that gives them a lot of authority. So that's one way in which we see them. Um, the other way is really quite interesting. Um, the body, having been freed from the rules and regulations about ritual purity, the body and the cultivation of the body becomes quite important. So women start going to uh, uh, clubs, for example bodybuilding becomes really important. I mean, everybody's doing yoga, everybody's doing Pilates, uh, kickboxing, um, 
martial arts become really important. I mean, when you look at these scenes on the streets of Iran, you see women are kicking back. I mean, this doesn't just happen, you know. There's a whole generation that is not aware of the significance of the body and the importance of it, um, the individual body, basically. And so that also, you can see that also at that level. And then the other thing is, which is happening is that, and this is still a work in progress, this one that I'm talking about, culture of shame held women back. You know, where did you go? Um, who were you with? You weren't home. Uh, it, was, it was really always a huge issue. And the culture of shame meant that you could no longer, for example, get married in this culture. You know, if if there was, look, I remember stories about so-and-so's grandmother's was kind of loose, you know, and that was enough to rule out a granddaughter because, you know, she came from a family where um, these uh, rules and ethics of, uh, of honor were not basically maintained so scrupulously. And so we begin to see that breaking down because of premarital sex, of course, um, there's something called white marriage, which is uh, really cohabitation, people living together. Uh, but, you know, it's still a very mixed society. So, for example, a girl would be dating um, maybe multiple uh, boyfriends, actually. She'd have sex. Um, in the end, she kind of waits waits to see if, you know, any of these works out. If, if it doesn't work out, she may actually go and have what's called hymenoplasty, restore her virginity, and then sort of get married a little bit in the more traditional way to uh, a businessman, for example, from a more traditional sector who expects his wife to be a virgin. So it's kind of very mixed. You know, uh, textbooks are all about the obedient wife and, you know, this, wearing the scarf and cooking and cleaning. But of course, in reality, women are doing all kinds of businesses and jobs and and there's a, a what I saw also an underlying movement of uh, kind of doing a passive aggressive game around the 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 laws that were coming. So if they couldn't change the law directly, they would do a, a passive aggressive kind of take their rights in another format. So exactly for example, when, right. when the law says you know the uh, temper temporary marriages were okay. Uh, by the law so a lot of people would turn around and play the game with those kind of marriages or... yeah, temporary marriage is an old form of concubinage mm -hmm. uh, very specific to Shi Iranian society in which you could have a primary wife and then you could have secondary wives and the second the secondary wives were basically think of the you know concubinage we see in China for example or India or even in European society the difference was that it was possible for the man to claim the child of this concubine as legitimate. I mean, you didn't have that right in Europe. You couldn't claim because of the Catholic Church and because that's an old story of how women and the Catholic Church colluded and took away that right from men in Europe. Uh, whereas before, before the 10th century, for example, European men could also do that. But in Iran, concubinage is kind of concubinage remained and it's called temporary marriage, as you said. It had almost died out. The Islamic Republic brought it back um, in in the same way that it wanted to bring back all the traditions and rituals of of pre modernity. You know that basically reduced women to a second class status. And as you said, women, you know, said, okay, you know, you don't let me date, but you let me sign this paper and say that I'm a temporary wife of this guy. Fine, we want to go to the Caspian Sea for vacation. We're going to do that. So for two weeks, they would have this paper. If somebody stopped them, they would show the paper. Yeah, they were temporary uh, spouses. And then they would come back and they would tear it up. You know, it didn't mean anything. What's interesting is that even though this possibility exists, many choose not to do it and live in what I call uh, uh, white marriages. Yeah, so it cohabitation. Was interesting that the way that uh, women have been uh, have become more rebellious and they're using the same laws. There was at one point, I think the um, the institution had said that it's okay and they promoted um, to, for someone to have a couple of wives, like up to four wives. And I remember there was the movement which many of the women went and knocked at the door of the family member of those uh, council people and went to their first, first wife and said, <laughs> we are ready. We want to be 
uh, the second wife and the third wife. Oh, that's really nice. <laughs> yeah, they created this shock effect yeah. that, you know, if, if you as a first wife are okay with this, then we're going to rebel this way, which it created a huge ripple effect in that. So it's like the, the revolution, it didn't just start 100 days ago. It started with different layers of women taking up and you know creating some sort of a rebelliousness using the same laws and kind of creating these paradoxical concepts with it right and that brings us to a very um tragic is issue which is right now which is that we hear a lot and cnn had a report on it on rape of political prisoners yes. this rape and the reason that the government doesn't mind publicizing it is another way of shaming the protesters and demonstrators. In other words, because it's a shame-based society, because these issues are so important. So this is a, like almost the last thing that this government can do. It tries to shame people so that parents would tell their children and the young people themselves would say, let's not go demonstrate because it's not just that we might get beaten and arrested, it's that they might get raped and then the shame of that. And so this is something now that Iranian society, and I'm beginning to hear advocates, um, leaders of various leaders uh, of and of this movement. And you know, people say this movement doesn't have leaders, but it does have plenty of leaders on the ground. Um, all of these women lawyers and intellectuals that we see, it's just diffused, it's not centralized, which is the reason it has survived, because if you had one central leadership, of course, they would arrest them. So it's more in the matter in the matter of the feminist movement, which never had a leadership, you know, uh, in that sense, centralized leadership. And so this is really, in some ways, in my mind, and um, the last barricade that that rape has to become at, recognized as a form of torture, um, and a person who is raped should be seen as the victim of that. You know, sort of like the debate we've been having on the Me Too movement, which Iran has also has had the Me Too movement. In other words, instead of blaming the woman for, you know, why did you go to his office and then he raped you and so forth, we've changed, we've turned the gaze, right? We now look at uh, Harvey Weinstein and we look at the male perpetrators. We put their names in the newspaper. We shame them. It's the men who are doing it who are being shamed, right? And so that's the kind of thing. So what I actually think that the gaze has to be changed. If there's anything we can do here is that we have to publicize the names of these men who commit this thing rather than focusing on the victim. We still put a lot of emphasis on, you know, these poor girls or boys who went there and became, I think we have to shift that in the manner of the Me Too movement and publicize them. And like the story that you said, let the families of these men know what is it that their men folk are doing in prison. You know, how would a woman, maybe this woman is happy because her husband has a job in the system, you know, and he brings money in, but let her be, let her be shamed uh, if her husband's, her brother, her son's name is publicized right. as someone who is doing this. And I think that would be I'll go a long way, taking a page from the Me Too movement and the generally the feminist movement, which is, I think, more of an example of what we see in Iran in the sense that it's a leadership that's diffused, it's spread all over the country, and there's no one person that you could say, you know, this is the leader of the movement. That's actually its strength, you know? It's, uh, it's interesting, though, that uh, Iran is... Uh... The, the women in Iran are, are getting up. But I know that you've done a study that it also had the Arab movement and, and the women in, in um, the Arab world. And now we're seeing uh, the pressure that is coming from Taliban to actually take back and not allow women to uh, go there. But then we come back and maybe what last year we had an amazing uh, right that women had about abortion. It was even... In this country after 50 oh, years. Yes, right. it was taken away from, from that. So... We keep seeing this um, concept of men thinking, men and some women who are more dependent mm -hmm. on men thinking that is so dangerous because it isn't just men creating these movements. There are women behind the men also who are right. supporting the men and coming out and doing this, which is for some reason the body of, of the women, the sexuality of the women 
um, even the thought process of the women, the voice of women are all dangerous and that, you know, it needs so much force for it to be shut down uh, versus, uh, you know, for it to be flourishing and creating and, you know, creating because that's what we do. We do create right. creativity. Um, so it's, you see this battle. It isn't only about, you know, the, the concept of Middle East and, and the modern society. We keep seeing the same issue uh, keep uh, coming up with right as I as I started uh, my conversation with you today. This is a global issue, and we're seeing different forms of it. So, in in the United States, for example, um, you know there is a uh, for for a long time now, uh, girls are just doing so much better at universities. My uh, I, I remember I had a job interview at a university, and I was talking to him about. Um, the situation in Iran where they had put a quota on because the girls had now suddenly become 65% of first year students at Tehran universities. And she said to me, well, you know, we do the same thing here. We just don't publicize it. And I said, how so? And she said, well, you know, we admit boys with an average of B, but for a girl, we expect an A. <laughs> and he said, that's how we do it. And she said, of course, the reason we do it is because we're trying to keep still more, more or less 50% boys and girls in the university, because the university is not just a place for education. It's also a place for socializing. For many people, it's eventually they, they maybe then or later they will pick their spouse from that community. So she said, in order to keep that, we've actually had to lower our standards. Um, so it's a question that because women have been denied, and I don't think it's particularly something, you know, that women are smarter than men, not that. It's just that women have been denied so many opportunities and education is really the one way in which you can um, get yourself um, a, a profession in, in the world. You know, for men, it's still, it's, it's a lot easier to travel around the world, to take over the father's business, um, Women also are under this constraint for, for many women who just choose to have children. You know, it's just it's so many years when you can have an education and then think about your future career. Uh, after that, for about 20 years, you get involved. If you have even one kid, you get involved with raising the children. So, um, so women are acutely aware of this and that's why they do very well in school because they understand like this is your one chance to make something of your life, you know. Uh, but let me say something also about right-wing women, which we see. Um, right-wing women actually have a, you know, feminists used to be complain, uh, um, criticized because people said feminists had a bad view of women. It's actually right-wing women who have a very negative view of men. <laughs> because, you know, you read their literature. I teach their work, actually, when I teach. What they say is that men are just useless. They're never going to change. You can't expect them to become egalitarian. It's just a hopeless struggle. Um, let them just go work for you out there, make money. And you stay home and have your children. Use them as cash cows. Years. Yeah, use them as cash cows. Yeah. So that's what right wing women say, basically, in their own literature. They don't quite use the word cash cow, you know, but that's the word. So they, whereas feminists think that. You actually can have a much more egalitarian relationship with a man. You can have a division of labor and you can, this could be someone that you really share your views with and, and, and take on his issues also and help, help him out in life, you know, in both ways as he can help you out. Um, so it's this kind of a very condescending way. So that's one part of it, of course. And yeah, so but the right wing women are really quite complicated. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. You know, some of these issues, of course, in this country, too, women are, are fighting in all kinds of ways. You know, uh, instead of having abortions, they're doing uh, the pill, the pill that you could use um, to basically make sure that there's no really viable pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And that's becoming very possible, you know. So as as far as uh, what the outside world, I know that the Iran and Iranians um, around the, the globe are trying to bring the voice um, to the world. 
so that this does, doesn't die down here, that we take whatever the voice of the Iranian women and men are to bring it out. And, you know, the other Iranians, they're doing an amazing job of letting people know, letting the politicians know, you know, doing things from the outside world. Is there anything that the women can do, since this is a women's led group, is there anything that you would see based on revolutions that have happened before, based on the Me Too movement, feminist movement, anything that other women around the world can also do in order to promote what is happening right now in Iran and you know, be their voice or bring the voice of the women out? Um, to be, I mean, as you said, the diaspora is doing a really quite a magnificent job. Um, and this, again, there's a history to it. Going back all the way to the beginning of 20th century, there's always been a very powerful Iranian diaspora. It used to be in places like Baku and Tiflis. Then it used to be in places like parts of Europe or even California right here. We had the Confederation of Iranian Students. I was very active, for example. And now it's really global. Um, and it's doing uh, quite a remarkable world um, in terms of making sure that the voices of the Iranian people are heard here. But I also think that if in, in any case, what I want to talk about is that there are people who have to flee and there are people who have to go come abroad. And it will be really helpful to help them um, provide jobs for them, um, you know, push for, uh, for example, a kind of amnesty, political asylum for some of these um, people who are really have no option but to leave the country. Um, and that is something that people can do at all sorts of levels. You know, when at the universities, for example, when people apply for admission, for example, and there are, um, I, I mean, for example, at my university, we've been really pushing the, the administration all sorts of ways, you know, for, for example, there are students who want or are supposed to come abroad and study and we pushed for the, the admission committee to, uh, for example, push their applications to next year, giving them a little bit more chance. In some universities are pushing for waiving that admission fee, for example. These are small things um, uh, which would really help people um, in various ways. Beautiful. Um, any last words? Anything we haven't um, talked about that you really want everybody to know? And no, thanks. That was uh, so lovely. As always, it was a lovely conversation with you. Thanks for everything. Thanks for really doing this program and bringing awareness to people. Um, I'm grateful for that. Thank you. I always learn from you. I I just get very emotional all the time. And um, this has really, I mean, I've, I came from Iran, you know, when I was 12 and I've watched like two couple of revolutions from outside, but this one, this one really hits our hearts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. it is really, it's all those beautiful young people on the street, um, essentially trying to carry out a non, non-violent revolution. You know, yeah. they're, they're, they look at people like Martin Luther King and that's 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 who they're they, there's a lot of talk about also the black lives matter I guess one thing I could say right now here is that this revolution is bringing greater awareness to the peripheries of Iran uh, for the Iranian people greater awareness that Iranians are not just Persian speaking people the Kurds have been quite magnificent and so have the people in Sistan and Baluchistan, the Baluchis, for example. Mm -hmm. And I think in poems, in poetry, in um, art, you see much more aware and awareness of the multi-ethnic nature of Iranian society. Yes. And that's something we really need to work on um, because we've almost, I would say, too much cent centered ourselves on the Persian speaking and the Tehran and you know big cities basically. Um, it's very important to reach out. I would say to Kurdish feminists right now, to Kurdish advocates of women's rights and Kurdish civil rights activists, as well as to Baluchis. There's some really great work that's coming out. Uh, but also understand that eventually, um, you know, when an Iranian more democratic Iranian society is created, it's not going to be that the Tehran women would always the demands will be the same as the ones in Kurdistan and Baluchistan. There has to be some awareness of that, that some communities will remain more traditional 
and they need their time basically to develop and that there has to be an understanding of that these issues um, aren't going to be all the same for what the Tehran woman wants versus what the Kurdish woman wants. So I'm I'm hoping that actually the media will now pay more attention to this diverse, more diverse, more multi-ethnic Iranian society. Beautiful. Thank you so much for taking Thanks this again. I appreciate your conversation. Take care. And for all of you who are out there creating an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you, happy holidays and hope that within these holidays, that not only you take care of yourself, but you take care of your community and the community at large of the globe. So thank you with being with us. Until next week, take care. Bye-bye.